you have your Bibles, and I pray that you do, we want to thank the choir, we want to thank Joan and Libby, and just thank you for singing out loud, just singing the prayer, and back, just sing the songs of time. Amen. Amen. That's what church is all about. Praise the Lord. Thank you so much. If you have your Bibles, I'd invite you to turn to the Gospel of Luke. The Gospel of Luke, Luke chapter 16, verses 14 through 18. Luke chapter 16, verses 14 through 18. <coughs> Luke chapter 16, verses 14 through 18. Sixteen verses fourteen through eighteen. If you have that passage in Luke's gospel, would you let that be known by saying Amen? amen. The Bible says in Luke chapter sixteen, verses fourteen through eighteen, it says this. It says, "Now the Pharisees, who were lovers of money, also heard all these things that he and they derided him. And he said to them, You are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts.'" For what is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. The law and the prophets were until John. Since that time, the kingdom of God has been preached, and everyone is pressing into it. And it's easier for heaven and the earth to pass away than for one tittle of the law to, to fail. Verse 18, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery, and whoever marries her who is divorced from her husband commits adultery. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we love you. We thank you so much for the beautiful songs and prayers we've heard so far. We thank you for the hour of Sunday school we've had. And Lord, now we ask and pray right now for your guidance, your understanding and discernment, and your spirit, Lord, to fall upon us right here in this place that we may better understand your word. And Father, I pray for all of those in here that do not know you as their personal Lord and Savior, that they would come to know you today, and that they would come, that they would be born again, that they would be saved. But Father, I also want to pray for those who are self-deceived and think they may be saved, but they're not, Lord, if they do as the Pharisees have attempted many years ago, and that is to justify themselves. Lord, if we're careful, and we're not, if we're not careful, God, we may fall into the same snares in this life we live. And I pray that we don't do that. Lord, I pray your protection and your guidance through this time of preaching and the time of proclamation of your holy word. Lord, that your word would go forth and accomplish all that you have set it out to do. Lord, we love you and we seek you now for your guidance and your spirit, Lord, to just fall on us, Lord. Lord, we ask and pray that you would stir our hearts to good works, that you would stir us, Lord, to do and, and to be obedient to the call of God in our lives. Father, we praise you now. We love you. We ask and pray these things in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. Amen. As we begin, as we look back in the, in, the, in the Gospel of Luke chapter 16, one thing you need to understand, the most dangerous enemies of God are not those who openly oppose Him necessarily. Like, if you take the most atheistic person in the world who says, I blatantly don't believe in the existence of God and so forth. The most dangerous individual to, or enemy of God is one who, who outwardly appears to live for God and to claim to know God, but yet inwardly they are far from Him. In other words, who pretend to be, or as Jesus would call a hypocrite, one who claims to know God, but by their outward actions, you know as well as I do, they don't. And you say, well, how can you judge that, preacher? How do you know? Well, Jesus said we can't judge the condition or we cannot judge someone's soul. Only he can do that. But we can judge a tree by the fruit that it bears. Amen? Amen. An orange tree has oranges on it. What does that tell you? It's an orange tree. An apple tree has apples on it. It has it's an apple tree, right? Sometimes we look at tree, the fruit of the tree and we know that it's right for the picking and right for eating, right? But sometimes it falls to the ground and it rots and has flies swarming around it and it smells, right? And we're able to say, hey, that's rotten and it smells. Very simple, isn't it? 
We complicate it, don't it? Men have, a, and we'll get into this in a minute, but men have throughout history perverted the things of this world and the things of God and the things of government. And on down the line we can go, men will pervert things, don't they? Are y'all listening? Say amen. amen. All right, well, let's go. We got seven truths out of this small little text here to pull. So we should be done in a couple of hours or so. And uh, I know we can get through this. And y'all just, just sit back and enjoy this and understand. Let us learn from the Word of God. Amen. Amen. First thing I'd like you to understand about the Pharisees who were listening to the conversation and to the parable that Jesus spoke about the unjust steward. Well, they were listening. And what the one thing we need to understand about the Pharisees in the first sentence of uh, verse 14. The Pharisees had corrupt motives. The Pharisees had corrupt motives. Motives. Look what it says there in verse 14. Now the Pharisees who were lovers of money also heard all of these things and they derided him. Now what things was Jesus talking about? Or what thing was the Bible talking about as Luke writes in his gospel? Well, we learned last week from the parable of the unjust steward that what you and I have to do, by no means is repeat this again, Jesus was not saying in this passage, in this parable, he was not condoning uh, making money in an illegal way. What he was saying, though, is kind of take a piece from this and learn how to cleverly prepare for your spiritual future. That's what he was basically saying. You be clever, be shrewd, be understand. Do what takes to set back and to understand not only with your earthly money, but with your spiritual condition and the condition of your soul. Be clever about that and plan for your future. Because if you don't, you have a future, and it's not in heaven, it'll be in the lake of fire. Does that make sense to you? And that's exactly what he was saying. Some of the things that can take us off of track, and that can take us, in, it's a snare, is the love and the worship of money. And this is what he says in verse 13. No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and man. In other words, you cannot serve God and money. You can't worship. Now, the, if we know from what the Bible tells us this, it's not the, it's not the root of all evil is money. It's not the money itself, but it's the love or the worship of money that becomes evil. Are you listening? Say amen. amen. See, it, many people in the Bible, most of the people you read about in the Bible, even Peter, some scholars say for Galilean, for Galilean scale, he was a pretty wealthy man. He wasn't a rich man, but for where he was from in Galilee as a fisherman, he did pretty well along with his partners, James and John. And their father, they did pretty well for where they were at. We go back all the way to the back to the patriarchs, to Abraham, very wealthy man. You go back to Job, an extremely wealthy man. King Solomon was the wealthiest and wisest man who ever lived. But did not all of those men at some point in their life fall and did not serve God the way they want to? And a lot of times it's because of what they own or they attempted to own or, or something along those lines that caused them to fail because they fell into the snare. See, because they began to pay more attention to possessions and the love of possessions more so than enjoying and receiving and having that relationship with Almighty God. It can take that away from you and become an idol in your life and in my life. We've got to be careful. We shared some of that last week. We've got to be careful with those things in our life. All of us do. Because this type of idolatry can creep ever so slightly into my life and into yours if we do not stay grounded in the Word of God, if we do not understand and stay in the Word, stay in prayer and realize that we battle against the flesh every day. But Jesus pointed this out and the Pharisees, it tells us, now the Pharisees who were, not they might have been, who were lovers of money. They loved money. He, they also heard all that parable that we just mentioned, these things, and they derided him. What does that mean? They mocked Jesus. They scoffed at him and said, ah, that's not true. We follow the law. We do this, we do that, and we'll get into that. But see, they had corrupt motives in their religion. They had corrupt motives within their religion. They did what they did not to honor God, not to glorify God, but to corrupt, be corrupt, and to seek these things 
for money. Pharisees were wealthy people. And most of them were wealthy. Apostle Paul was a wealthy man until he got saved and forsake all and gave his life to Christ there on the Damascus Road. If we're not careful, folks, we can fall into that trap. And there's been many a man in our day and time, modern day, who set out with every intention to serve and love God and win people to Jesus who fell by the wayside because of some sort of sin and because of the love of money. Now, I'm not going to name them all because there's too many to name. But they all started out preachers on fire, got on TV, got famous, and all of a sudden all they cared about was money and not the love of God and winning people to Jesus. Amen? You see how easy it is. Now we can sit back and say, boy, look how sorry they are. Look how, look how low they are. But listen, that can happen to anybody sitting in this room here today. Amen? If you are not careful and if you don't focus your eyes and your mind on the things that are above and not on the things of the earth, start here first. Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and all of its righteousness and all these other things will be added unto you daily as you have a need. God will never let you down. Yes, it's nice to have things. Yes, it's nice to, to be financially secure. Yes, all of that's okay. But do not let that become your God. Because it so easily can, and as it did in the Pharisees' life. He says that they had corrupt motives. And they mocked Jesus because He warned them of that. He warned them of that. You know, the Bible says in the end times, in 2 Timothy 3.2, it says that the people would become lovers of money and lovers of themselves. Do you think we live in a time such as that today? I'd say we do, don't you? I think we do very much so more than we realize. We talked about that in Sunday school a little bit. I saw a little clip uh, in Rome the other day. They showed the old Colosseum. Half of it's gone, you know, half of it's still there. And I got to thinking, I said, you know what? That reminds me of all these huge ball stadiums all over the place. And now they have statues of the former great players who, who, who performed one day in those stadiums many years ago. And there's statues around uh, the basketball ring, the football rings. And, 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 and I think about the Apostle Paul in Acts 17 when he went into Athens and all those statues that were there and all those false gods that people had erected to, to worship statues and false gods. And he came to one and said, oh, they said the unknown God there. And he goes, I perceive that you are a people who are given over to idols. And you can go to the University of Alabama, and I'm going to pick on them because I love to pick on them. And I'll, I'll pick on Kentucky too here in just a minute. I got a, my mother sent me a, a, a letter through email. Said the ten dumbest fans, listen to me now, the ten dumbest football fans and basketball fans in, in the top ten, you know who number one was? The University of Alabama. Dumbest fans. Now don't swell up with pride because you know who's number two. <laughs> I got a different. I'm not making this up. Number two. Big U and then a K. Basketball. And folks, I'm preaching to myself. I love college football. That's basically about the only hobby I have in this day and time. But I cannot let that deride me. I cannot let that become a God. And it can become one, I'm telling you, because I speak from experience. It can become one so easily if we allow it. You understand that? That we spend more time worried about that than we do with life, our family, our, our, our walk with God, our relationship with God, learning the Word of God, knowing doctrine. We'll talk about that tonight. So I know every one of you will be back tonight for that as well. We live in a day and a time that we don't even know what we believe any longer. And we need to know what the Bible says and what we believe. Amen? Amen. <coughs> because if we don't, the evil one will deceive you and deceive me. And he'll use money, he'll use other forms of idolatry to snare you and to take your attention away from God. And this is what had happened to them. You see, the Pharisees were so wrapped up in this. What were the Pharisees? Again, as we've talked about this over and over, Pharisees, the name Pharisee means separated ones or consecrated ones, ones who alienated themselves away from the regular people in life, opposed the average, average day Joe because they were not as religious as they were. They bragged and, and, and boasted about knowing the Word of God and living by the law of Moses. They bragged and boasted on that. That's why Jesus, you'll notice, 
all throughout the Gospels, the ones who Jesus condemned the most were the Pharisees. It wasn't the average everyday Joe sinner. It was one who claims to know God and claims to live for God, as we said, outwardly, but inwardly, as Jesus and John the Baptist said, they're what? They're like filthy, rotten tombs on these whitewashed tombs on the outside, but on the inside, they were filthy and nasty because they played a part. They acted. Then that's why Jesus called them out. As we said before, I'm going to remind you again, are you listening? How many times in the Gospels do you see this? You have heard it was said, and I tell you, it is written. He had to correct them because they were more concerned than in spiritually oppressing the people to follow their rules, their man-made rules, their man-made rituals, to follow, to, to make them look like that they were holy and that they were pious, but inwardly, they had no relationship with God. And Jesus came preaching repentance and forgiveness. Man, that wasn't even on their radar screen. They had no clue to that. That's why Nicodemus said, huh? What, born again? How can a man be old be born out of his mother's womb again? And Jesus said, I tell you now, Nicodemus, you're the teacher of Israel. And you don't know that you must be born again. I'm telling you, First Baptist Church of McDowell, if you don't know, you need to know now. You must be born again or you will never enter the kingdom of God. Amen. Rules, rituals, and tradition and all that stuff it has its place. Some of it's good and some of it's not. But none of that will get you into the gates of heaven. None of it. You'll go into the lake of fire if you trust in tradition and rituals and man-made rules. And that is exactly what Jesus is about to tell these men right here in this scripture. So, we see that they had corrupt motives. But also look in that same paragraph, in that same verse. They were antagonistic toward God's demands. They were antagonistic towards God's demands. Look what it says. That now the Pharisees, who were lovers of money, also heard all these things, and they derided him. They scorned him. They mocked him. They, they mocked Jesus. For what? What did Jesus teach? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for they shall, seek, and they shall receive mercy. Love your neighbor as yourself. He, what he, all of John the Baptist even, if your neighbor needs your, your coat go and get him your tunic too love your neighbor, give, forgive and show mercy, show compassion they didn't do any of that but yet they got mad and they scorned Jesus and mocked Jesus when he would heal a man on the Sabbath and break one of their little Sabbath rules that they twisted around in scripture it wasn't true they, they would do all kinds of things like that they deride him and mock him for preaching the kingdom of God. All of these parables that you see in the New Testament, they tell this. What the kingdom of God is about. What it's like. And it was so opposite to what they thought that they lived in opposition. And when he started preaching forgiveness and preaching repentance and preaching compassion and those type of things. But, and if you don't do that, then the judgment of God will fall on you if you don't repent. It made them angry because, see, their, their thought was this way. Oh, if I go to the temple so many times, if I wash my hands so many times, I purify myself in the pools around the temple so many times, I go to church so many times a week, I make so many sacrifices a week, then I'm okay. Does that make any sense to you? It doesn't make any sense to me either. Because, see, what do you have there? You have a works-based salvation. They thought, number one, because they were Jewish and because they went through all those rituals that they would enter into the kingdom of heaven. So in other words, they can just live how they want to. They can be corrupt and take people's money. They can, they can spiritually oppress everybody around them instead of lifting them up. And then yet because they're Jewish and because they follow tradition and they follow all these rules and they, belong, and they go to the temple so many times, light so many candles, light incense, sacrifice animals, that they're going to make it into the kingdom of heaven. That makes absolutely no sense at all. And when Jesus told them, he said, no, mm -mm, you got to be born again. They said, whoa, wait a minute. You're of the devil. That's what they would tell him. And they would accuse him of that. They derided him. They mocked him and scorned him. People are like that. You ever notice that? Here's what the Bible says about that in Isaiah 56, 11. He calls people like that greedy dogs. <coughs> Isaiah 56, 11. He also says it this way. Greedy dogs. And he says, he said, for, for gain they're greedy. Jeremiah 6, 13. And Jeremiah 18 says it this way. When they have something in their mouth to bite a hold of, he said, they cry peace. 
But when you don't give them anything to bite a hold of, they cry a holy war against those who are holy. In other words, you ever heard this one? I've heard it many times. I've heard it many ever since I've been saved. You know, one, five, and two since I've been a pastor. If you don't do for somebody, guess what? You're the scum of the earth. You're not a Christian. But as long as you're doing, as long as you're doing it, you can, oh, everything's peace, peace. But when you don't do, then your holy war is declared on you. It also says that in Micah, in Micah, Micah um, 3, 3, 5. <laughs> Micah 3, 5, same thing. But see, that's how the Pharisees were. They're not worried about the relationship. They're not worried about anything like that. All they're worried about is greedy gain. What you can give me, I'm taking, and I'm going to take more. And the more you give, the more I'll take. Never compassion, never grace. It's take, take, and take. Are you listening? Say amen. Y'all yeah. look like a, a, like a calf staring at a new gate or something. <laughs> Looking at me like I got three heads or something. Up here. Are y'all all right? Okay, I'm just checking. Just want to make sure. But they also had, they had corrupt motives. They were antagonistic toward the gospel. Why are people antagonistic toward the gospel? I was. I was very hostile toward the gospel for God's sake. But you know why? Because I lived like a heathen. I was a hoodlum. I loved to drink. I loved to party. I loved to do drugs. I did. But you know why? And somebody said, hey, you need to hear the gospel. If you don't, guess what? You're going to bust hell wide open. And I said, well, all my friends will be there too. I said, oh, no, they won't. They may be. They might not. But it's not going to be pleasant. It ain't a party down there. It's not a party in the lake of fire. You understand that, don't you? That's eternal torment and pain. For all of eternity. You think about that. Think about that. So eternity, eternity is a long, long time. And you know what? Jesus loved you so much, he died for me and for you. So we wouldn't have to go be cast in the lake of fire. That's grace. That's mercy. That's compassion. That's the love of God right there shown for us at Calvary's cross. All that other stuff will do nothing but take you away from your relationship with God. Look what else he says here, though. We say oh, people are antagonistic. When people are antagonistic toward the gospel, is there's one reason. They don't live in the truth and they don't know God. When the truth confronts people and the truth of the gospel confronts people, it will make some people mad. Some people are just indifferent. Some people, but what it will do, it exposes. It has a way... And only God's way to do this. When the gospel is presented to people who don't live in the truth, they get antagonistic toward it. They get angry toward it because something in their life, some sin that they're holding on to, that they think they can't live another day without living this way. They got to hold on to this little bitty party life or this little sin here or I got this little pet sin that I keep in my closet and when nobody's looking, I, I take it out and pet it like this. They think if they turn loose of that, they're going to lose something. Well, I'm here to tell you, you will lose something if you don't give your life over to Christ. You'll lose your soul to the, to the lake of fire, I'm telling you right here today. But if you do give your life to Jesus Christ, you will live with Him for all of eternity. And everything He owns is yours too. And I don't know about you, but I, I want to live in a place where there is no sin. I want to live in a place where there is no more sickness. There is no more lying. There is no more drugs. There is no more bank accounts. Any of that. <coughs> Excuse me. Because all we have and all you'll ever need is fulfilled in Christ. In Christ. In Christ alone. That's it. That's as simple as that. That's as simple as I know how to make it. But they are antagonistic. And people who don't know Christ and don't live in the truth are antagonistic to God's demands. And God makes the rules. And you may say, that's evil. That's wicked. No. That's grace. And that's mercy. And that's love that God has extended to you and to me. But it made the Pharisees mad. But they are also this way. They are also self-justifying they are also self-justifying. Look what it says in verse 15. And he said to them, You are those who justify yourselves. Let me explain something. I'm having a real, real, are you listening real quick? Let's just say amen. amen. Very quick theology class. Are you ready? Real simple. This is a simple version now. Every one of you here can get this. I know some of you already may know it. That's great. Are you listening? Amen. Thank you. Let's go this way. There's four aspects to salvation. Four basic aspects. I'm going to ask you a question. I'm going to quiz you. You ready? Number one is regeneration. That's being born again. You have no control over that. God does a work that's supernatural in your heart and changes you from the inside out. That is Holy Ghost regeneration. All right? You know, everybody all right with that? The Holy Spirit meets the Word of God and births faith in you. Faith in Christ, in your heart. You and I cannot do that. Now, we cooperate with God in that. You understand everybody okay? 
Yeah, yeah, that's God's work. Regeneration in a man's heart, soul, and then here. All right, number one, regeneration. Number two is justification. Justification means it's a legal term, and it means this. You are no longer, uh, your sins are no longer counted against you. You are, just, you are justified in the eyes of the holy God, not because of your righteousness, because you and I have no righteousness. You are justified by what Jesus did at Calvary when he shed his blood and came up from the grave three days later. That's how we are justified. That means that sinful lifestyle that I used to lead and that you used to lead, I hope, and some of you are still leading right now, if you come to Christ, what Jesus does is, oh, that one belongs to me. He's my child. I wipe away, cast his sin as far as the east is from the west. And no longer do I hold that sin against him because I paid the penalty. I paid his debt on the cross. That is biblical justification Amen. by faith in Christ. Now, you want to hear, read a whole big story about it? Read Romans and read Galatians. We are justified by faith. The, the faith will live by, no, the, 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 the regenerated, the ones who have faith in Christ are the ones who are justified. Justified. That's justification. It's a legal term. Your, your sin debt has been wiped clean. Now, once we are saved, do we still sometimes sin? Yes, we do, unfortunately. Yes, we do. That's an unfortunate thing, but that's that war against the flesh and the spirit that you and I will battle until God calls us home. And He does this to us. Here's the third one. Are you ready? So we've got regeneration. We've got justification. Number three is what? Sanctification. There's a two-way street here on sanctification. He has sanctified you. He has set you apart. He has put you apart for His good works, for His glory. And daily, every one of us should make a progression in sanctification. A lot of people think this way. And if you ever heard somebody say this, well, you know what they do when the church down there, they got baptized. But I seen them out drinking beer two nights later. Listen, I'm not condoning that, but you know what I'm saying? Let's just use that picture. It could go in a hundred different directions. We all know that. But just because you get saved and you get baptized, number one, does not make you super Christian. Number one, it does not make you perfect. And number two, let's back up. You don't have to be perfect to come through these doors and to be saved to start with. Best thing you need to do is come through the door to start with. And you start by giving your heart humbly to God. You start then and God becomes that supernatural work, that regeneration. And then he, he justifies you. And then from that day forward, every day, He starts molding and making you into the image of His Son. He, he, we can't do that on our own, folks. But you know what we, what we do, what we play a part in that part? is we agree with Him about our sinfulness by confessing our sins to Him daily. And we agree with Him in sanctification that, Lord, I'm going to follow You. I'm going to be at church. I'm going to read my Bible. I'm going to pray every day. I'm going to learn as much about You, Jesus, as I possibly can until You call me home. And when He calls you home, then and only then will You and I be fully sanctified, made in the image of God, God's Son, Jesus Christ. But don't fault people. When they fall. Because people will fall. People are going to sin. It doesn't make it right. But here's the thing. As part of sanctification, you and I must strive every day to be like Jesus. Amen. Don't sit back. And I know it's so, it's so tempting because we've all said it. And don't say you hadn't because you hadn't. You're lying. Don't lie. Don't lie in church. Don't lie outside of church either. But we've all said this. Well, I'm not perfect. Well, that's obvious. Uh, yeah, that's why Jesus came out of heaven and died for you too. Because I'm not perfect either, and neither are you. So let's not state the obvious here. Let's do something about it. Repent, ask God to forgive you, and daily ask God to clean you up. Daily ask God to purify your heart and clean your hands that you will be ready to ascend to the hill of the Lord as the psalm says. You have to cooperate with God in that sanctification. Now, if you sit back and you do this number, we'll talk about this one tonight. I know everyone's going to be here, but he did not save you to give you a free card to say, <laughs> you know what, preacher? I'm saved. I got saved. I got baptized. I walked down the aisle. I gave my life and my heart to Jesus. And now I can just sin all I want to. You know why? Because once saved is all they saved. No, that's not true. Yes, if he saved your soul, you're saved from now on. And you can't become unsaved. And I know there's been some talk from here and there, and we'll talk about that tonight a little bit, about people who said this number, but I just give up on Christianity. I used to be a Christian. If somebody says, I used to be a Christian, I, mean, I got news for you. They never were! 
Why in the world would you stop being a Christian? I've stopped today. I'm good. You can't do it. It's not in the Bible. There's never one person in this Bible, and I'll stand by it and I'll say it just like Adrian Rogers used to say. If you find one person in this Bible who's been saved and lost and saved and lost, I will give you $10,000 in cash. I'll give you $100,000. I don't have it, but I'll give it to you because it's not in here. It's that simple. Now listen. Do you understand that? You cannot be saved at all. Once you're in the hands of God, He has got you sealed forever. Amen. Now you'll, you'll bury some. We all stumble. We all make mistakes. But yet, is there a... Here's the question. Is there a steady progression of being molded into the image of God in your life? Can you honestly look yourself in the mirror? You and God, come on, and say that. Can you say, well, you know, and everybody's going to say, well, I did that. Don't worry about it. Can you say, is there a, a steady, like a, like a bulldozer, steady plowing along, or a tractor, steady plowing, not real fast, but going through life, steady moving toward the kingdom of God. Now, sometimes that tractor will stop on it. Sometimes it'll, the, the disc will fall. Well, you know, you say, yeah, well, yeah, yeah, I, I'm using farmer terms here. I don't know if y'all understand that. Sometimes it'll quit. And that's where you don't need to do is quit. Because life is hard. Life is difficult. And just because you're a Christian, let me tell you this to you, it makes it more difficult. But again, there is nothing more blessed than following the Lord Jesus Christ. There is nothing that will bless your heart and bless your life more and fulfill you right here, right now, and forevermore than coming to know Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. Because that's the joy, and that's where that joy comes from. Far supersedes happiness. Happiness is overrated because happiness is only depending upon your circumstances, what's going on in your life right now. And by this afternoon, something's going to make you unhappy. You know, by tomorrow morning, maybe you may be happy again. Don't hold on to that. That's just an emotion. It's good when it's there, but it's going to be times when it's not. And, but yet, you, can, you can't take joy from a Christian. You understand that? That's put there by the Holy Spirit of God. So we have what? Justification. We have sanctification. We have uh, let's see, regeneration first, sorry. Regeneration, justification, sanctification, what's for them? Glorification, amen. And that's we are fully complete and made whole, raised up into heaven and given a glorified body. That thank God for that. And and we have a we don't ache no more. We don't have arthritis no more. We don't have cancer no more. We don't have heart disease no more. And I can say this in my own personal life. My father went on to be with the Lord on August the 12th. And now my dad's not overweight anymore. He doesn't suffer from heart disease anymore. He's not looking back on me. Boy, look at my boy. No, he's not. He's looking in the face of Jesus. There's no reason. Why would somebody go into a realm? Think about this now. You listen, say amen. I don't want to offend anybody. I'm not talking about your granny or your aunt or anybody like that. Listen. Why would somebody who went into the arms of Jesus Christ look back on a sin-filled world? They're not going to do it. Now, I know that may make some of you a little agitated, but you think about it for a while. Man, they're in a place that has no idea of sin again. They're in a place filled with constant joy. A place where there's no more tears. There's no more asking the question, why any longer? Man, that's why I want to go. I don't know about you, that's what I want to go to. And I'll never, we'll never have to worry about drug addiction again, alcoholism, uh, people being ugly to one another. We will know the fullness of Christ. We have a new body raised up to be like Him and to join Him. We can eat all we want to. We don't ever have to worry about nobody talking behind our backs or stabbing us in the back or being ugly to us in any way, form, or fashion because sin will not exist any longer. And you live in that realm, they're not going to look back and go, oh, well, I hope, mom, hope mommy's all right. Or, no. They're made complete in Christ. Does that make sense to you? Look at it from that way. Now, I know we say things sometimes, and, we, and I know it's sentimentalism, but it's not biblical. Does that make sense to you? Is, are y'all all right with that? And I know why people say that. I do. And I've said things like that. But the more I study, the more I realize, I say, hey, listen, we won't look back. I would want to look back. You, I, would, I wouldn't want to. I mean, why, when you're made perfect and in a perfect world and a perfect realm, why would you look back on a sinful world? I mean, were 14-year-olds walking to school and shooting it up? 
I mean, well, this is the world we live in, folks. Why would you look back at that? Why would you look back at the, a world that's full of famine and disease? Heart disease, cancer, all that stuff. Why would you look back at that? When you are made complete in Christ in glorification. And you see, ask yourself this question as Jesus stated in verse 15. He said, you are those who justify yourselves. There's not one person in here who can regenerate themselves. There's not one person in here who ever has lived, breathed, or walked who can, who can justify themselves. There's not one in here who can sanctify themselves. And there's certainly not one in here who can glorify themselves. Do you see how privileged you are to know God and what He has done and how He has made that possible for us to have a relationship with Him and to live with Him for all of eternity? Do you see that that is the highest privilege of any man, woman, or young person is to come to know Jesus and let Him justify you? Because when He does it, it's right. When we do it or the Pharisees did it, it was wrong. Because they wanted the, they wanted the praises of men. They wanted all the men and all the women and everybody to live them. Oh, look how holy we are. Oh, look how pious we are. That's what they desired. And as Jesus told them in another scripture in the Gospels a couple of times, He said, you have received your reward. If the praises of men is what you seek, you'll get it. And that's all you'll ever have. Seek the praises of God. They were self-justifying but they also sought human approval. He said, "He said, you, you're, you who just those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts." Think about that one. That's time to think. Here in this part of the scripture, are you listening? Say amen. amen. Here is where we must meditate. Here is where we must ponder. Here is where we must reflect. Here is where we must think and think real long about this one now. God knows your heart. That doesn't mean He knows the actual anatomy. Yeah, He does. He knows that he, he created it. He knows your, the heart and the Bible means He knows your mind. He knows the way you think. He knows you better. You know yourself. He knows what you're going to say or think before you ever do it. That's scary to me. You know what that does to me? Some people that might make mad, here's what they do. They'll slough it off. I don't believe that. I do. I know He does because the Bible says He does. He knows you better than you know yourself. And what that does to me, and I, what it should do to you and me both, is humble the living fire out of every one of us. Because God knows your heart. You can play, in other words, what he's telling them, you can play your religious games. You can play games with it all you want to. But if you don't have a relationship with him, God does know your heart. He knows when you're fooling around. He does know when you're, you're acting, act, acting apart. He knows. He knows everything about you. That's why you must confess your sins on a daily basis. To clean out your heart every day. To make you more like Him. But He knows. He knows you. And He says, for what is highly esteemed among men? What is highly esteemed among men? Well, He hit on one real hard. The love of money. He, uh, idolatry. We talked about sports. Hunting, fishing. All that stuff. That can take, take your life. And, and, and what's highly esteemed in our culture? Let's just take one for instance. What happened here, uh, I guess maybe right out a year ago? Some NBA player, don't even know his name, don't care. To be honest with you, I just pray for him to be saved. Came out of the closet, as they say, and named the world, told the world he was gay. And our president of the United States put his stamp of approval on that. So we live in a culture where that's highly esteemed among men, isn't it? Isn't that a shame that an abomination before the Lord is highly esteemed in our culture? I don't think it's highly esteemed. I think it's sickening and disgusting. And we have a leader in the freest country and the greatest country in the world who puts his stamp of approval on that type of living. You know, that's, what's the difference in saying, hey, I love how that person got drunk last night. Hey, good job, buddy. That's highly esteemed among men. I ain't never seen anybody drink that many beers in one sitting. That's highly esteemed among men. Don't believe with our TV commercials. How many of them is alcohol related? A bunch of them. Highly esteemed among men. But you know what the Bible says? It's what he, he says this. It's high, what's highly esteemed, that means greatly valued or highly treasured among men is an abomination in the sight of God. You know what an abomination is? To God, that means something that is detestable, disgusting, and foul. The original language means that's a word that means something that stinks like rotting flesh. It's an abomination before the Lord. But yet we have people, I, I've even heard Christian people 
put their stamp of approval. Oh, it's all right for somebody to be a homosexual. No, it's not either. And I'll tell you what I would say about that. People can make their choices, and that's a choice that somebody makes. That's a poor choice. They can make that choice all they want to. But I'm telling you this. Here's what I will not stand for. Don't you cram that down my throat and tell me it's normal. When it's not normal, it's an abomination before the Lord. And I got biblical proof of it where God wiped out two cities off the earth on account of that one sin that's an abomination before the Lord. And if America doesn't repent and believe in the Lord, He'll do the same thing again. And you know what? He'll be perfectly just and righteous to do it all. Because He is just and righteous. And we're not. We highly esteem stuff that's a abomination to God. We're in trouble, folks. Not, not us individually, but look where we are as a culture. Look where we stand right now before God as a culture. I pray for this country daily because of this type of thing. But he goes on to say this. They were evil in their hearts at the end of verse 15. An abomination in the sight of God. They were evil men who loved money, who held spiritual oppression over the people. And they, 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 they kicked against the gospel. But look what also it says in verse 16. They rejected the gospel of the kingdom. Look there. The law and the prophets were until John. What does that mean? The law is the Old Testament. And the prophets preached the, preached the gospel even in the Old Testament until John. Why does it say John? Well, John was the last, John the Baptist was the last of the Old Testament prophets. From Malachi to Matthew, there was 400 years where God did not send a prophet or a messenger. Silence from God for 400 years from Malachi to Matthew. When John the Baptist came preaching on the scene, the kingdom of God. He came preaching, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. That means the kingdom of God now has been opened up. The Old Testament promises were now fulfilled. But also, always remember this, and I hear this a lot. Do not discount the Old Testament. The Old Testament is just as important as the New. But what John the Baptist was so unique is, he was the last of the Old Testament prophets. But he also witnessed the, the proclamation and the fulfillment of the New Testament covenant of grace. Because what did he say? Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. When Jesus came down to the Jordan and there John the Baptist baptized him, he had one hand in the Old Testament and had a hold of the New right there, didn't he? The fulfillment of God's promises right there in John the Baptist. And again, as Jesus said, not me, the greatest preacher who ever lived was a Baptist. Praise God for that. Amen. Amen. Greatest among men. He said, Jesus said it, not me. So don't get mad at me. The greatest among preachers was John the Baptist. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. He goes on to say this. <clears throat> Since that time, here's a turning point. The kingdom of God has been preached and everyone is pressing into it. Does he mean everybody's running to the church to try to get in? No. You know what he means by that? It's like Jesus said. He said, and well, we talked about it. Strive to enter through the narrow gate. For many, I say to you, will seek to enter and will not be able to. Such as those he was preaching to that day. And he was warning them again. Do you understand that when Jesus would warn and warn and warn and warn, Paul, Peter, all of them would warn. Do you realize, folks, are you listening to say amen? amen? That the grace of God is going reaching out to them. Just like I'm reaching out to you now. And I will with the grace of God, with the gospel. That you know what? We cannot save ourselves. We can't regenerate ourselves. We can't justify ourselves. We cannot sanctify ourselves. We certainly cannot glorify ourselves. That is why we need Jesus. That's why he came and he died. He fulfilled the law and the prophets. He didn't abolish it. He said, I didn't come to abolish the law. I came to fulfill it. And he did, he did because you and I cannot keep the law. And that's what he was trying to tell these men who thought they could by their good works and through their rituals. They needed to be saved just like you and I did. And I hope maybe you today. <clears throat> he said it's easier for this. He says it's easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one tittle of the law to fail. What does he mean by that? Well, you understand a tittle is this. You ever seen an apostrophe? An apostrophe, a little quote, or a comma? That's what a tittle is similar to. That small of a, of a mark. That small of a mark, he said, the law will always stand. The Word of God will always stand. And it's always true. He said heaven and earth can pass away. 
But God's law and God's word will always remain. What do you trust in? What is your faith in this morning? Is your faith in money? Is your faith in your football team or your basketball team or your deer stand or your car or your bank account? What is your faith in this morning? What are you trusting in for your eternal future? Are you being clever and shrewd like the unjust steward here and making plans for your future? Or are you just sitting back and letting it go? Well, what, what, here's how some people's attitude would be. Well, we'll just sit back and let it go. Whatever happens to happen, folks, if you do that, you will bust hell wide open. Don't just sit back, especially when God's offered you grace and mercy. He goes on to say this, and this may sound funny, or not funny, but he throws this one in there. Whoever, verse 18, divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery. Now, don't shut me down right here. Let me explain, okay? Most time when the pastor goes to speak, you don't pack a pew to preach about uh, sin or divorce. But understand this. This is what we're going to say. So you listen say amen. amen. Whoever marries her is divorced from her husband commits adultery. What Jesus was saying, it all ties together. That may look a little out of place in what he's talking about, but the Pharisees in that day would do this. They would take the law of God which they're trying to twist, Deuteronomy 24, 1 through 4, and what they would do was take that, that law and twist it to meet their own needs. If their wife burned the toast, they could write it with a certificate of divorce, and they did it often. Often more than the people divorce in this day and time. But they did it chronically over and over and over again. Now understand this, Baptist folk, are you listening to say amen? amen? Just because someone has had a divorce does not mean that God cannot use that person. Matter of fact, in John chapter 4, there was a lady who had been divorced not once, not twice, not three, not four, but five times divorced. And Jesus used that woman to win a whole village to himself. By the testimony of her going to testify about who Jesus was. These men took the law and twisted it to meet their own. If they didn't feel like their wife was very pretty anymore, they would write them a certificate of divorce and go find another. And on that, they kept doing it chronically over and over and over again. That's why it came down so hard. But if you've gone through a divorce, I'm sorry. I know there's nothing good about divorce. Nobody wins in that. And yes, God does not approve of that, but yet God's not going to condemn you for that. I'll tell you what God will condemn you for. You listen, say amen. amen. Rejection of His grace and of His mercy and those who claim to speak for God, those who claim to know God, but do not know Him, that is who He'll condemn. There, uh, divorce is not being part of the sin. I, I hate it for anybody. I understand that I do. And listen, God can use anybody. Just because you've had a divorce, does not, that is not the unpardonable sin. You know what the unpardonable sin is? It's trying to steal God's glory and give it to the devil. And rejection of the gospel. That's the unpardonable sin. That's what it is. And if you've been divorced, I'm sorry. And I, I, I know you, I know, and nobody sets out that way. You understand? It happens, folks. Life happens, doesn't it? It just happens sometimes. Sometimes it just can't be avoided. But there is forgiveness in Christ. There is forgiveness in Christ. Is everybody on the same? Are y'all all right? Yeah. What about you here this morning? Have you been forgiven? Has Christ Jesus entered your heart and saved your soul? Have you humbled yourself before the cross of Christ? That old rugged cross that we sung about a while ago. Have you come to Christ and said, Lord, forgive me of my sins and save me from myself, from the wrath of God, from my sins and from hell. God saved me today. Have you done that? Have you come to God and asked Him for forgiveness? Are you religious just in your thoughts and in your actions? You just come to church out of habit because Granny did and, you, and, you, and her Granny did and your Granny, they come and brought you, made you come. You come out of religious habit or do you come in here to worship God? You come in here to focus on Jesus, not on people you have something against or some of you don't like this or that one, I don't care. Are you coming in here Sunday after Sunday to worship God in spirit and truth? Do you want to worship Him in spirit and truth? Do you want to know God here today? Here's what you do. You humbly give your life to Him by asking Him to forgive you. Admitting your sin before God. Not to man, but to God. And ask Him to save you and you repent. That means you turn away from sin and you turn to God and embrace His grace and His mercy that He's extended through His Son. That's what you do. And then and what he'll do, he'll enter your heart. He'll change you from the inside out. And you'll never be the same again. Now, if you're saved here today, maybe there's an idol in your life. And you need to take that idol. You know what you need to do is bust it up. You come to this altar right down here. 
And you set up, let God consume it with his holy fire and get it out of your life. Get your priorities straightened up. Get your life and your eyes focused on God. Folks, we live in dangerous, violent times. If you don't know Christ here today, you need to come to know him. Maybe you do know him, and you need, to, you, need, you need your own personal revival. You need to come, make an altar where you are, or come to these steps and make one. Right where you sit, and get right with the Lord. Repent, repent, and give your, give your heart a pressure and rededicate your life to the Lord. Where are you this morning? Where is your heart? What are you fixed upon? What do you think about the most? Let God examine you and examine your heart. This morning. Let's pray. Father God, in the name of Jesus, I praise you. <clears throat> Lord, I love you. And I thank you for your word. Thank you for the power it possesses. I thank you for your spirit, Lord. And I thank you for every individual in this room today. And I thank you for the families they represent. And I thank you, Lord, for our community, our, our church. Lord, but I thank you most of all for your son, Jesus Christ. Who he, he himself said, he is the way, he is the truth. And he is the life. No man can know the way. No man can understand the truth. And no man can have eternal life apart from Christ Jesus the Lord. He said no man can enter the kingdom of God apart from him. Lord, I pray if there's one or many that are there within the sound of my voice who are not saved, Father, will you save their souls here right now? Father, I pray for those who are saved who are in need of a spiritual revitalization in their heart, a rededication, to get in their priorities straight. We all need our bell rung every now and then, Lord. We all need our cage rattled every once in a while. Lord, I pray you rattle mine every day. Lord, I pray you, you get my attention every day, Lord, because I know I need it. I know everybody in front of me does too. Lord, help us. We cry out to you, Lord, because we have no hope but in you. And apart from you, Lord, we are nothing. Have your will now, Lord. Have your way <clears throat> in your house here today. Thank you, Jesus, for loving us enough to shed your royal blood for sinners like me and, and those who are in front of me. God, thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for your son. Lord, we praise you and we love you now. We're so thankful to you, Jesus. Have your will and your way right now. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.